All right. Shalom. Shalom. First and foremost, we want to give all praise, all honor, and all glory to Yahweh, Bahashim, Yahweh Shai, Bahashim, Racha Kodash. We also would like to give double honors to our apostles and the elders of Great Millstone that do rule well through the Holy Spirit. And we want to say peace, blessings, salutations as always unto you elect that are across the four ones of this earth, fulfilling your lots in all truth and all sincerity. The name Yahweh Shai or the name Yahweh, I'd rather say the word Yahweh that you all heard is the name of the Heavenly Father, who the world calls God, Jehovah, Yahweh. All right, those aren't the actual way you pronounce the name of the Heavenly Father, the Almighty, in the Bible. All right, his name is pronounced Yahweh. That's how it was pronounced by the ancient Israelites. That's how it was pronounced by who the world calls Jesus Christ. And that's how it is pronounced forever. Baha Shem is translated in the name when he translated from Hebrew to the, um, for, sorry, from Hebrew to English. And Yahweh Shai is the name of the beloved son who the world ignorantly calls Jesus Christ. His name is not Jesus. It is not Yeshua. It is not Yehoshua. The name is Yahweh Shai. That is how it was pronounced by the disciples that walked with him. All right. And that is how it is supposed to be pronounced. All right. So this is going to be another classroom session. All right. Lord willing, it's edifying through the Holy Spirit. And we're going to be talking about the chariots and the glory of the Lord and how it's described as, as the glory of the Lord. And also, too, how it is. Um, how can I put this here? It's always lined up with salvation when you go into the chariots. All right. And whenever we see those chariots or those, you know, those balls of light that you see. Obviously, of course, that doesn't just mean that you got a seat in the kingdom. All right. When we see those chariots and such, it's always that mindset that you have of hope and salvation, but also, too, that we are being watched. Right. Okay. But when you see those, the Lord is showing his glory and that glory is going to aid us in salvation. That's what we're going to be caught up in through the Holy Spirit. All right. You'll find certain scriptures likening the chariots to horses. And again, they're called chariots. And we're going to talk about that as well. All right. Now, the first scripture that we can go into is going to be the book of Habakkuk, the third chapter. And, and you can go to the chariot, you know, point, point of it. Just, just the yeah, you know, I mean, you, start, you can start at a good point, Elder. You know, now, that's the, good for you. The head of the chapter is the Most High's deliverance of his people. See? So it's dealing with deliverance and how it's going to happen. Now, it says, uh, I start at 8, all right, going into the vision of uh, destruction. That's going to take place when the Lord returns to deliver his people. It says, Habakkuk 3 and 8, was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thy anger against the rivers? And, you know, the prophet Habakkuk knows the latter end and how it's going to be. And when we teach in the highways and the hedges, a lot of people say what we say sounds like hate speech. It sounds angry, but we are literally giving you an expression via, via voice of how the Heavenly Father feels. All right. We talk about salvation. We talk about destruction. <clears throat> Just as you read it in what, Isaiah 61, going into the acceptable year and the day of vengeance. So when the gospels preached, both of those aspects of salvation and destruction got to be brought out. And when you read the books of the ancient prophets and you read about the visions that they had, some of those visions are terrible. Mm -hmm. And when the Lord brings his aid and his salvation, best believe he's going to save his elect. But he's going to bring terror, dread and judgment upon the heathen. Mm -hmm. And even the elect are scarcely going to be saved. It's going to be something that we've never seen before. The gravity of it. Mm -hmm. Existence has never seen it before. Yep. You know, you got to squam. Yep, Revelation uh, 11, when it talks about come up hither, when they get delivered, the very next verse is the great earthquake that's going to be taking place at the same time. Okay. So Habakkuk is expounding on that very moment in a vision he saw. So let's read it again. It says, Habakkuk 3 and 8, was Yahweh displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea? Again, the earth is going to shake. You read about it in the scriptures where it says the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunken. Now, granted, we know that's going into the missiles hitting. All right. The earth is going to shake. Water is going to move. But also when those things happen, Yahweh Shai and the angels are going to make their grand appearance on the earth and the deliver and deliver, excuse me, the elect out of that fire, as the scriptures say. So yep. when all those chariots enter the atmosphere, there's going to be a lot of stuff going on in the earth. A lot. You know, remember that account when Yahweh Shai resurrected from the dead and you had a Mary. OK, both Marys that was there. You had Anna and it was two other women that were present when Yahweh Shai resurrected from the dead. OK, and when the angel spoke to those women, the earth shook 
And you can read about that. So when the angel came down there, the earth shook. So just imagine a plethora of angels, all those chariots that are there. Mm -hmm. The earth is going to shake. Reality is going to bend and be altered. Right. Okay. I got a quick one. Come on. Jeremiah 50 and 46. At the noise of the taking of Babylon, the earth is moved and a cry is heard among the nations. The earth is moved. All right. And this earth is very big, but it just goes to show you the gravity and the extent of when Yahweh Shai comes back with those angels. Mm -hmm. And you read about the example of it, you know, when, um, uh, put it like this, when the Israelites were coming, they wanted to pretty much plead with the Lord. Yep. They was tired of Moses pleading with the Lord, right? So they wanted to plead with the Lord personally. And what took place? The commandment was given that they didn't lay with their wives for three days, that they cleaned themselves for three days, and they didn't get involved in any type of carnal acts. They had to be on point because the Lord was going to make his presence no one show his glory unto them after those three days to plead with them. Mm -hmm. And during that third day, what took place? All right, it got dark outside. The earth shook. The presence of the Lord descended. And Jake didn't want to do They didn't want to commune with the Lord no more after that. You know? So just imagine that happening there in Sinai versus the whole earth. Right. Because the Lord's glory is going to be revealed. Matter of fact, I'm going to get this in Jude real quick if I may. Because even Enoch prophesied about that. You can find... About Enoch prophesying about those chariots to come, Yahweh Shai coming in Jude. Now, this is the book of St. Jude, chapter, uh, well, it's only one chapter, but I'm going to read verse 13. And it says, Raging waves of the sea, foaming out of their own shame, wandering stars to whom it is reserved, the blackness of darkness forever. And it talks about those raging waves and those seas, because as we read those precepts, the earth is going to move out of its place when Yahweh Shai comes down. With those angels and those chariots of salvation. Right. Okay. And verse 14 says, And Enoch also, the seventh of Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. And those saints right there are talking about the angels, which just goes to show you the regard that the Lord looks at the Israelites at, because we're called saints too. You know, matter of fact, um, Bapak Shaw, can somebody pull uh, Genesis chapter 32 really quick and we can start from the top? Just to go into how, you know, we're we're pretty much the, 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 the earthly aspect of the Heavenly Father's watchmen and the angels are the heavenly aspect of it. Right. This is uh, Genesis 32 and 1. And Jacob went his way and the angels of the Most High met him. Right. And this is going into when Jacob was catching hell. I believe he was actually on his way back from, um, you know, Laban's, you know, pretty much that region in Padanaram. I believe this is when he's coming back. And he was catching hell. You can read about that scenario that Jacob went through for those 21 years after he left out of the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. All right. So I believe this is his voyage back to there after he left his father-in-law. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is the Most High's host. And he called the name of that place Nahanaim. Yeah, Manaim. Manaim. Now, can you go into that real quick, Baba Kishaw Elder? Absolutely. Because when you go into this, remember, he saw the angels. This is either when he's on his way up there or coming back. Okay, please correct me on You know what I'm saying? If somebody's listening, just put on the comment boards, you know. But anyway, this is the account that took place. Okay? Mahanayam. It says two camps. Two camps. Because you had the camp right there where Jacob was. And then you had the camp in the heavens. In the heavens right? All right? So you had the heavenly host, all the saints. All right? And then you had the saints on the earth. So we're all like-minded in the same spirit. The angels, they're just perfect. They don't got flesh. So they got their own things that they got to do. We're down here, but we're still all like-minded together because we're those same spirits of fire that serve the Lord. You know? And the Lord is going to use those angels, starting with Yahweh Shai, to deliver his kinfolk, his family. He's the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts. Yep. That's right. That's right. The Lord of armies. Right. right? And it's a reason why he's called the Lord of hosts. One thing to remember, because we are going to go back to the chariots and go back to Habakkuk, uh, the third chapter, we got to remember that the Lord is a man of war, as we read that in Exodus 15, and we can get that here shortly. So when you read about the chariots and how they're likened unto horsemen on occasion, you got to put your mindset in a warlike fashion of how the Heavenly Father moves, okay? Because think about military, right? You have the foot soldiers, which is called the infantry, and then you have... The backup that comes, which is called the cavalry. Right. All right. And the cavalry can come in the form of the airplanes dropping bombs or tanks. And back then in the ancient world, you had the infantry, which were the foot soldiers. And then you had the cavalry, which were the horsemen, 
back in the scriptures. Right. Okay. Now that word for host, it always says Lord of hosts, mm -hmm. is uh, the, the Hebrew word is tazabah. It means that which goes forth, army, war, warfare, host, organized army, host of angels. Mm. All right, war, warfare, service to go out, war. Right, you see that. So when you when you look at it, how the Lord how the Lord moves again, He's a man of war. He's the Lord of hosts. So when you read about His angels and then go into chariots, you know what I'm saying? That's just a military, uh, you know, a military phrase because they're soldiers. Because I'm gonna say this: when we say the chariots, and we obviously know, the, you know, Esau will call them UFOs or the UAPs. We know what they are. But when you look at people like Vocab and other so-called Christians, and unfortunately even a lot of guys that call themselves Israelites, when we say that the so-called UFOs are the chariots, they look at us like we have two heads. You know, a lot of people have say that those are demons floating around. There's no, there, there's nowhere in the scriptures that goes into them being demons. Right. Now, granted, they're angels. You know, when a demon is an angel, so whatever. You know, but that don't just go into them just being demons. People try to say that those are the demons. And they equate it with the book of Enoch and all that stuff. No, there's no scriptures that goes into that. When you see those in the sky, Esau calls them UFOs, the best way he can describe them. But we know how to identify them. And the scriptures identifies them as angels, uh, the, the, the chariots of salvation, okay, a will within a will. There's a lot of different ways that they're talked about in the scriptures. Right. But they are equated with salvation. Right. You know? Yep. You got it, Saquon. Habakkuk. Mm -hmm. Habakkuk 3 and 8. All right. Was thy wrath against the sea that thou didst ride upon thine horses and thy chariots of salvation? There you go. So, yeah, it's worded thy horses and thy chariots of salvation, not that they're little horses. I remember we, we've been in plenty of situations where we read these scriptures and a scoffer comes up and we read this scripture or scriptures like this to prove that these are the actual so-called UFOs. But they'll be like, well, no, the scripture says a horse. This ain't talking about an actual Pegasus in the sky made of fire all right this is war terminology all right this is cavalry this is what the scriptures is talking about the chariots of salvation the cavalry of salvation cavalry brings aid to the foot soldiers mm. that's how it is in the military cavalry brings aid to the foot soldiers just like the chariots of salvation excuse me are going to bring aid to the israelites that are here the foot soldiers all right because right. we're all part of the host at the end of the day two camps right Okay. When you watch, when you watch movies or shows that's going into war and all those different things, when it starts to get too hot on the ground, mm -hmm. they bring in the cavalry. That's like right. You that's you know right. And that's when you have that extra. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? We gonna need that extra. You see? So once the uh, uh, once Jacob's struggle hit, eventually it's gonna come to a point where uh, of what World War Three and all these different things is set up. The cavalry is gonna be, like you said, the chariots to come. Beam us up. That's right. When all everything else is going to shit. That's right. You know, like you said, we gotta be. We, that's the only way you gonna get out of here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You can't you get on no boat. You can run. Yeah. yeah. You can't run. Okay. You can't get on the boat. That you ain't gonna work. On the water. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because it, it, it's gonna be fire. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be it, the, the the whole. It's, 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 it's everything is gonna be on fire. That's it's right. Be on fire. That's right. So what you gonna do? Jump in the water? Exactly. You gonna boil? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You gonna try to run? You ain't gonna outrun yeah. them. You ain't gonna outrun the cow. That's you right. Know? Now the bunkers and all that is set up. It's set up for them to be able to uh, 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 fulfill prophecy. Right. Much. You right. know what I'm saying? You thinking you escaping, but you're not, because the cavalry don't stop. That's right. You know what I'm saying? Gone, gone. Well, if oh, so, so. that word for horses in the Hebrew is sawas. It mm -hmm. says swallow swift. See, swift, mm -hmm. Isaiah 19 and 1, the Lord cometh upon a swift that's cloud. Right. Swift cloud. That's the spirit I was equating the cloud. That was yeah, kind. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. That's right, man. Because, again, what does Psalm say? And there's other scriptures, too, who make it the, the clouds his chariots. Chariots. Okay? And we're going to go, Lord willing, we're going to touch up on all of that right there. Mm -hmm. But it's just telling you the swiftness that they're going to uh, come. To, you know, the, pretty much the energy that they're going to bring when they come. All right, again, the Lord is a man of war. I didn't say that three times. Yeah, it might be brought out a few times just to drill the point. Okay, what comes to uh, kind? That's a bit. What comes to mind? I, while y'all was talking, I was thinking about this too, like the movie Forrest Gump. You had um, when he went back in the woods and rescued Lieutenant Dan because his legs was jacked up. He carried him and ran out there because there was an airstrike that was called in by Lieutenant Dan. You know, so Lieutenant Dan already called in the airstrike. 
Forrest Gump picked him up and ran up out of the woods and they had that airstrike and hit all those gooks right over there. And I'm just using that as, as a carnal example of how the Lord likens his cavalry or his chariots. You know, the elect are going to scarcely be saved, but they're going to bring that fire and subdue our enemies. Again, it's military terminology. If you don't understand that, you're not going to understand the concept of why they're called the chariots, why they're called horses and such. You have too many scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, where the Lord numbers the amount of foot soldiers that are there, 10,000 foot soldiers, 2,000 horsemen, this, that, and the third. It's likened like that for a reason. Okay? You got it, Elder. All right, this is uh, uh, Exodus chapter 15, verse 3. It says, uh, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh is chariots, and his host have he cast into the sea. Mm. His, cho uh, his chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. You see, which him sent, uh, the, the, the chariots down here were no match for what the Lord was bringing. Right. You know what I'm saying? And this is the, like, the, the Lord using it as a war tank. Mm -hmm. they, they was using their chariots and all those things to chase us down. You see? Yep. But the Lord being a man of war, that's just like how Esau drop a uh drop a uh, a truckload of guns in the hood. Mm -hmm. He giving you something that he already done played with. He already know what that do that's right. to human flesh. Mm -hmm. So you thinking that you got strength in your chariots, so now the Lord gonna show you his. That's the, right. The chariots done end up being in several situations with the Israelites. You know? Man, I got one for you. Gun, gun. Isaiah thirty one and three. Now the Egyptians are men and not the most high power. And their horses flesh and not spirit. Mm -hmm. When Yahweh shall stretch out his hand, which is Yahweh Shai, both he that helpeth shall fall, and he that is hoping shall fall down, and they shall all fail together. Mm. So oh. the, 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 the chariots of Yahweh Bashan Shai, <laughs> Esau's blessing is no match. Right. You know what I'm saying? Just like Pharaoh's chariots were no match. How much more Esau, you know, with all of the power and technology he's been blessed with, there's limits to it. It's, it's, it's flesh. It's not spirit, you know. Con, con. I got a precept too. Just touching up on the chariots. And this is going to be in the book of uh, Second Kings, the sixth chapter. I mean, the, the beginning of it goes in, but I just, I just start at the point. Okay. And it says, and this is an account with uh, our forefather Elisha. Who was the understudy of Elijah? All right, a hell of a prophet, you know. And I say that in righteousness, okay. One of the greatest prophets that you read about that's documented in the scriptures, and he's so great because of the faith that he had in the Lord. All right, so this is an example of the Lord aiding them when they were faced with danger, okay. The Lord sending His cavalry when the foot soldiers looked helpless, okay. When everything looked hopeless in the flesh. So this is the book of Second Kings, chapter six. And I'm going to start at verse, uh, let's see here, verse 7. Uh, let's start at verse 8, actually. It says, Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God, this being Elisha, okay, sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. So this is a time right now when Israel was in great conflict with the Syrians. And when you continue in verse 10, it says, And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, and saved himself there not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servant and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the kingdom, the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. All right, and we're getting to the point here now. And he said, Go and spy where he is. So when these people went out to spy where the prophet Elisha was, it says that I may send and, and fetch him. And it was told, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. So they wanted to spy out. That way they could take him, take him prisoner, however it, however it was. All right, so it was a, a hopeless time if you look at it in the flesh because you got soldiers spying you out, getting ready to take you. And it was already a time in Israel when they was in great warfare, when things didn't look good. Mm. Now, when you continue in verse 14, it says, Therefore, send he to the horses and chariots and a great host. So you had this great host that came over there just for this one man being Elisha. And the reason why they did that, because they know 
that when the God of Israel is with the man of God, things happen. Yeah. And the reason why I'm explaining it in such a way is because we read these old stories from the past and we look at the mindset and the faith that our forefathers had when things look dire. And we look at these accounts to give us hope and such and, and enhance our faith because we know this devil's getting ready to come down, having great wrath, as the scriptures say. What? Revelation 12? So we're going to need aid from the heavens just as we're talking about. You ain't going to find aid and nothing else except for from the heavens where the Lord is going to send it and, you know, fetch his elect. Okay? I got that word cavalry for you. Gone, gone. That's a bet. They got three versions. They got in the past, it was soldiers who fought on horseback. Mm -hmm. Commission. It says modern soldiers who fight in armored vehicles. You got your tanks there and you all go. Your, your, uh, jets and all these different things. And then you got the third one. It says used to refer to a source of help or rescue in an emergency. Especially as a last resort. That's right. So when those bombs drop it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the cavalry is what's going to get us up out of here, That's man. That's right. Which is the, the heavenly host. That's right. You know? That last resort, man. Yep. You know, and that's what it's literally going to be, the mm -hmm. last resort. Because, you know, you look at the flesh. The flesh can't win against the blessing that the Lord gave Esau. The flesh ain't going to win against any type of military stuff. Everything Esau got out here is set to divide you Israelites from the truth. He, man, he has the flesh. He has it down. Weaponry, that's why it trips me out, but we get it. Why well, you got Israelites that are so hell-bent on you know, being at camp, strapped up and everything, re relying on your weaponry, really, your, your weaponry, relying on carnal acts. You got Alazar from the Sakari just recently that had, you know, uh, on a podcast with some guys. I was it no I don't I don't know if it was no jumper or not again. But pretty much he was repping. I believe it was no jumper. I recognize the Jake that's on there. I usually see him talking to that Jake that's on no jumper. Okay, con for sure, but he's pretty much talking about Hoover Creek. I'm, I'm from Hoover. I'm Hoover this, Hoover that, you know. And it just when you look at guys like this, it just shows you that they're carnal one, and that they're looking at carnality to save them out of danger. You know, when you look at that gang life, that street life, all they rely on is the is the flesh, weaponry and such. You know, when you an Israelite. Yeah, that's why I say like we we was talking we were talking about it earlier in the week. We was like Jake the master getting shot. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So. I mean, if, 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 hey, like, uh, you got precepts going with uh, I'm a little you know, I'm not trusting I'm a little my hope. You know, right. uh, King David was talking about not trusting his bow, but trusting in the Lord. You know, so at the end of the day, you can have weapons and all that. That's cool, but it's it's, it's a normal thing for somebody to die strapped. You gotta see plenty. I would say I've seen plenty of situations where dudes get shot reaching for their pistol. You know, right. <laughs> what about that scene in uh, the Purge? All these niggas, yeah, we're we gonna protect our hood. They ain't gonna come here and do that. All of them got their guns and they all getting worked up and shit. They sent the drone and shot all the niggas. Shot all of them. Shot all the niggas. What you gonna do with that? You know what I'm saying? You're gonna so, need divine intervention. Yeah, it, this, 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 uh, this notion that you don't need the Lord. Like, I, I don't need the Lord. I got my nine. I got my gag. Man, look, that's your life. You know what I'm saying? That's your life. Yep, this is Psalms 44 and 6. For I will not trust in my bow, neither shall my sword save me. But mm -hmm. thou hast saved us from our enemies. You see? And hast put them to shame that hated us. Now, that means something to a sincere brother. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like we say all the time, if you got a gun, that's cool. A registered gun. A registered gun. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jake can say, oh, I can get one. You know, you know what I'm saying? Jake in the back alley and shit. Well, yeah, you, you can get a hot gun and, and uh. get yourself in a messed up situation. And having a, I will say, if, if, if you legally got a firearm to protect, that's fine. But you know when Jacob's trouble comes, that's only going to go so far. Yeah, you know, that's what I'm saying. You're, you'll never run out of prayer. You'll run out of bullets. Right. You know, you got it. Yeah, basically the Lord has to deal with you, man. This is uh, Psalms 20 and 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of Yahweh, our power. You see, that's stronger. That's stronger than any weapon on earth. You know what I'm saying? No weapon formed against thee shall prosper. The reason why that says that is because the Lord got some way stronger than what's right. than what we see. Yep. And it's our faith and our belief that's gonna show us what those weapons are, what those weapons are right. when that time comes. So yeah, you can have you can have, look, you can have a 50 round clip and you can have all that. That's fine and dandy. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But that's not gonna get you on a chair. Yeah, wars right. have been won. We've already seen wars won with battles won with guns and Esau blowing shit up. We've already yeah, saw that. Yeah, this right. victory that's coming to us is gonna be 
on a whole nother level by a different means. Yeah. That's right. When you read in the book of Daniel, the 12th chapter, where it says in the days that's coming are going to be unlike any other. We also got to factor in the way that the Lord is going to bring his salvation to, you know, Daniel 12 goes into destruction. Well, destruction and salvation are in hand with one another pertaining to Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. Right. So when you read Daniel 12 and it goes into that, that's because the Lord is going to bring some crucial salvation as well. Right. Hey, it says in that day when the archangel Michael shall stand up, you know. So, hey, yeah. And like you said, Zaquan, no weapon formed against thee shall prosper. I'm gonna go, was you done with that? Was y'all done with y'all precepts yep. that y'all had? Yep. I'm going to go back to the second Kings chapter six, because this is an exact example of no weapon formed against thee shall prosper. And the Lord using his chariots to do that. OK, so this is back in second Kings chapter six, verse uh, 14. And it says, therefore, sent he the horses and chariots and the great host. Again, this is a Syrian host that was sent out to the land of Dothan, where Elisha was. OK, and it says, and they came by night and compassed about the city. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? All right. So the young man cried and said, What the heck are we going to do now? So you can put yourself in their shoes and just look at it. How many, how many soldiers it actually was. How many weapons that was sent forth, you know, to, to get you was? Oh, weapons. You, mm -hmm. you in this situation with uh, a, a nine with 16 in the Exactly. Corner. Exactly. <laughs> you going to get destroyed. Bro, you going to try to, what, the first 16 bullets you going to shoot and then the Lord going to put magic bullets in there, bro? You know what I'm saying? Like, the Lord, like, Lord, look at that. Look at my son. Yeah. Busting them caps. Yeah, exactly. Said, no, man, that's not what's going to send the chair. Right. <laughs> right. These are all weapons that were formed against Elisha and that servant. Mm -hmm. A lot of individuals right here. But when you continue, it says this, verse 16, and he answered, fear not. So this is Elisha telling the servant, don't be afraid, because in the flesh, it can be easy to fear in that time. You got all these men of war. These are skilled men of war. These are soldiers. You think about Esau's military circling around you. All right. Yeah, he's a fool. You know what I'm saying? You don't go to that class. Esau's uh, military circled around you. And Esau got crazy. He got crazy ammunition. Mm. This man has guns you can't even think of. Like you said, y'all decide. When he put when he when he sends guns to the hood, just know that they've been there, done that. Mm -hmm. They sent them there because that's in the past. Now they got some new different shit. You know? That's right. So he has different stuff. So you can pass about with, with military men skilled with war. You think about it. These men have trained in boot camp, like went through the trenches, did a whole lot to become men of war. Their whole mindset changed. So you're an inexperienced man, and you sitting here contending with all these men of war. You're gonna need aid from the heavens. <laughs> you're gonna need aid from the heavens in that time right now. And the reason why I'm explaining it in such a way, because this is what these men was faced with it in this time, which is why his servant feared. It's easy for any one of us to fear in that time. And it takes a seasoned vet in the truth that has faith out this world to, to reel him back in. And the Lord had to intervene to enhance his servant's faith. The Lord intervened just to show forth that they weren't by themselves, you know? Right. So when you continue in from verse 16, it's, I'm sorry, yeah, verse 16, and he answered, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And that's a heavy mindset to carry when you looking and seeing death right in front of you. You know, when you don't see anything by you, it's only two of y'all, okay? But he said it's more of them than it is of us. And when you read verse 17, it says, And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And Yahweh opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Now, earlier, just a second ago, Yadazak, Elder Yadazak, you went into the example of cavalry and what that means. And one of the definitions was when the, the uh, pretty much the horsemen come in when everything, pretty much aid comes in when all things fail, yep. when everything looks hopeless. And that's exactly that scenario that these two men was faced with. In the flesh, things looked hopeless. But the Lord sent his horses and his chariots. Now, they weren't literally horses and the chariots in the sky. No, this is military. This is military aid the Lord sent from the heavens. The host from the heavens came down to protect the foot soldiers on the earth. And that's just what it is. And earlier you read Exodus, the 15th chapter, and that song is sung going into our deliverance out of the land of Egypt. You know, now, when you read about that and you brought up the um, example earlier in Isaiah 19 
And also you can read about it in um, ample scripture. Psalms 104 comes to mind where the scriptures say he likens his clouds to his chariots. Mm. And you go into that account in Exodus where you had that pillar of fire that was right there. All right. And that cloud, you read about that. It was a cloud that was there, that, that, that pretty much that there was there, a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. And that same cloud by day and pillar of fire by night helped and separated the Israelites from the Egyptians before the Red Sea split. You know, and that cloud there was present the whole time that we was in the wilderness with it starting being present when we was exited and delivered out of the land of our captivity. Mm. Now, the reason why I'm going into this, because, again, the scriptures likens the clouds to his chariots. And we touched up on the chariots. Now, I'm going to read this here in the book of Acts, the first chapter. And I'm going to pull some words up here. And this is the account with our Lord Yahweh Shai right before he went up into the heavens. Okay. And the way it's worded is beautiful. Because it shows you that Yahweh Shai went into a chariot, a chariot of salvation. But this is the book of Acts chapter 1. And I'm going to start at verse, I'm going to start at verse uh, 8. Matter of fact, you know what? I'm going to start at verse 7. And it says, and he said unto them, well, I'm going to start at 6, excuse me. When they therefore came together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And again, they expected the kingdom of Israel to be restored when Yahweh Shai was offered up and sacrificed and resurrected on the third day, not knowing that there was more things that were going to have to take place. All right. And verse 7 says, and he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the father hath put in his own power. So he's pretty much saying in a roundabout way when you continue to read that it's more events that are going to happen on the earth in order for the kingdom of Israel to be re restored, mm. you know. And just before I continue, we talked about this um, at camp Friday afternoon. I brought it up very briefly. But when you read Revelation 12 and 10 where it says, now is salvation come? I like to equate that with that because back then they expected it when Yahweh Shai came and right before he had ascended up. But when you read it in Revelation 12 and 10, it's now telling you now is salvation come. So you had to go through all these things. You had to fulfill all these prophecies. Esau had to fulfill his portion of prophecy. And now the Lord is going to bring the end. All right. And the fact that we see these chariot sightings and even Esau seeing the chariot sightings, that's showing you that this time is up. You know, that's a sign in the heavens to show forth that Yahweh Shai is getting ready to come down and deliver his elect. You know, now going back to Acts, the first chapter and reading verse eight, Yahweh Shai said, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, that is still being fulfilled. All right. The word was brought forth in Judea and Samaria and in different parts of Asia Minor where you can read it in the Acts. But when you read the prophecy in Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, going into us being the Israelites, we'd be scattered even to the uttermost parts of heaven. All right. It says, thence will I gather them and thence will I fetch thee. So we've been scattered to the uttermost parts of the earth. And through this gospel being preached, we've been gathered and we've been fetched. Just as Yahweh prophesied here in Acts, the first chapter. OK, now, when you continue, it says in verse nine. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him mm. out of their sight. All right. Now, that doesn't mean he just flew into a cloud. There's too many scriptures, and we explained it already, that goes into how his clouds, or his chariots, I'd rather say, are also likened unto clouds. Right. So Yahweh Shai was taken into a chariot right here. Now, I remember I did a lesson on this some years ago. And I'm going to pull this word cloud here in the Greek. And when you go into the word cloud here in the Greek, you have the word Oh, I guess plugged to my headphones. I got you. Come, on, come. On. You know the word is nephele, okay? And when you go into that, it says a cloud. It says use of the cloud which led the Israelites in the wilderness. Mm. Okay, so that right there also shows you that it was Yahweh Shai that was with us in the wilderness in their chariot. Because it says he was received in the cloud. And from the definition, it's looking like that cloud that was with us in the wilderness right there, which equated us with salvation coming out of uh, Egypt, you know, which is why I wanted to explain that as you read that Exodus 15, you know, so it was Yahweh Shai that delivered us in a swift cloud, 
in the wilderness, swift cloud, just like what Isaiah 19 was read. Right. Okay? I got a precept. Con, con, no. Isaiah 63 and 11. Then he remembered the days of old. Moses and his people saying, where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? <laughs> the shepherd of his flock. Mm. That's how he brought them up out of the sea. Heavy. Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? That led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name, that led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness as that a, they may not stumble. Come on, bro. Yeah. <laughs> no, as a horse in the wilderness led them, bro. So that's telling you that Yahweh was present with our exit out of the land of Egypt. And our exit out of the land of Egypt is a form of salvation. It's so much of a potent form of salvation. We literally keep that memorial to this day when we hold the Passover, when Yahweh Shai delivered us in that cloud or in that chariot, okay? And when you read it back in what? We read it early in Habakkuk, the third chapter, which we can go back to it because we didn't really finish up on that. But it goes into the horses of salvation, just as the horses of salvation delivered us out of Egypt, but it was in a different way. This time, we're going to be taken up in the air. Right. Lord, when are we of that number? And we can hold um, Isaiah, the 26th chapter after this as well. Okay, you want Habakkuk? Yeah, come, come. All right, Habakkuk chapter 3. And uh, I'll just read 8 again. Or come, come, that's cool. Yep. Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea that thou didst ride? upon thine horses and thy chariots of salvation. So that's how it's gonna be when Yahweh sends Yahweh Shai and those angels to deliver. The earth is gonna move out of place. There's gonna be a lot of dread and judgment. But in the midst of that, the Lord is gonna shine that light on his elect because they're gonna be the ones that get beamed up in that. Wisdom of Solomon, the fifth chapter talks about that, how the heathen and the nations and even the wicked of our people are gonna watch that salvation and groan within themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's gonna be so much groaning, the fact that you see all this judgment and despair and death and that you're not being taken up in the air. You know, you got people that are going to be experiencing an experience that existence has never fathomed. And they're going to see people they hated being delivered up. Makes sense why the scriptures say there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, very reminiscent to the flood. You know, when the, uh, the spirit of the Lord closed the, the, the door on the ark, people was banging on it and they couldn't get in. The same exact way, you know. Um, is it, what does it say in verse 9? It says, uh, thy bow yeah, yep. was made quite naked according to the oath of the tribes, even thy words, Selah. That's right, that's right. Going into the weaponry the Lord is going to bring, again, the bow, other military, military wording, the horses and chariots, the bow. All right, so the Lord is going to come and bring war. Okay, and we said it earlier before you, know, before you came in and such like that. You know, you have a negative connotation that comes with the, the chariots and how we teach it when you look at it from a Christian lens and such. They say we sound crazy for saying they're the UFOs and such like that. You know, people will say, well, the Bible says a horse right there. That don't mean that it's going to be Pegasus flying in the air with a man with a boat. No, that's going into military terminology. Like you read earlier, cavalry can be likened to a tank. It can be likened to an F-35 fighter jet today. A broken you know? arrow is a stolen missile. Yeah, that, that's right. You know? Absolutely. So they have, they, they have that jargon. It's a spiritual army jargon. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's we it. know what it's talking about. That's it. When we, we, uh, when, we, when we see the clouds and when we see the wheel in the wheel, we know what that's talking that's about. That's right. You know? Mm -hmm. That's right. And we've also seen them with our eyes. It's like, right. bro, like, like, how they going to talk about something that we've seen? Right. You know, just like they tried it back in the ancient world when Yahweh was crucified. Like, they tried to tell him not to teach. And it's like, how you going to tell us not to teach what we've seen? Right. We bore witness to it. More you so know? More so word of prophecy, man. You know, but yeah, that's that's it on that one. I believe I called for uh, Isaiah 26. Con, con. Uh, you can start like the last four verses. And then we can, you know, we can read Revelation, the 11th chapter. You quoted it earlier, Yashawamba, but we can get that too. All right, this is uh, Isaiah 26 and 18. It says, we have been with child. Uh, yeah, we have been with child. We have been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not brought any deliverance in the earth. Neither have the inhabitants of the word fallen of the world fallen. Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell, uh, ye that dwell in dust. And that's beautiful, man, because you know that's going into us being Israelites resurrecting unto this knowledge. 
waking up unto this truth. After all these years, we was down, we was kicked. You know, the scriptures goes into it as we was dry bones when you read about that in Ezekiel, what? That's Ezekiel 37. Mm. Goes into the valley of dry bones. There's too many scriptures that talked about that we were dead at a point of time. But now we're being risen up through the Holy Spirit. Isaiah, the 44th chapter, prophesies it, talking about how we were going to even go as far as calling ourselves Israelites, which is what's being done. And when you read this account that Elder Yadizak is reading right now, it was going into the process. First, we had to be woken up from the dust. First, we had to be risen. And then something is going to segue after being risen up, which is salvation. Go ahead, Zaquan. Verse 19, it says, Thy men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. For the dew is of for the dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. There you go, awake and sing, which is this new song that's being sung. As we've awoken, we're singing this new song, which is the gospel being preached. Okay, again I quoted it earlier, Isaiah 61, the acceptable year and the day of vengeance. That's being preached right now before we're being delivered. All right, and Revelation, the 14th chapter, even tells you how we got this. It tells you an angel is flying in the midst of heaven singing this song unto us. Okay, you got it, Saquon. You're in Isaiah 26, right? Yep. Okay, cool, Isaiah, cool. Uh, Isaiah 26 and 20. It says, come, my people. There we go. Into thy, into thy chamber. So after we woke up, after we were risen up, okay, after we sung the new song, what's going to take place? It says, come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers. And this is going into our deliverance from the earth into the chariot. Okay, that's what this scripture is going into as you read about it in what Revelation the 18th chapter where it says come out of her my people right. Okay, as the Apostle Paul you read about that in what first Corinthians 15 where it says it shall be a shout made Okay, this is going into the elect being delivered up into the chariot mm. into the cloud Just as Yahweh Shai was delivered into the cloud all right. And say he's coming back like that. He's coming back. That's right. Dang, I didn't even bring that. I, dang, I didn't even bring that part out. I forgot to pull that up. Matter of fact, before you continue, I'm going to bring that out real quick, just because I still got a hell. So really quick, this is back in Acts, the first chapter, y'all, and this is going right back to what Yahweh Shai told his disciples before he ascended up into that um, chariot. So it says back in Acts chapter one, verse nine, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld. He was taken up in a cloud or chariot, received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which are angels, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Yahweh Shai, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So just as he went up into the heavens in the chariot, He's going to, the chariot's going to descend and he's going to come back down. The chariot's going to come back down pretty much. Okay, that's what that verse is saying. Right. All right, and as it comes back down, what's going to happen? The elect are going to go up. Mm -hmm. Okay, just as we're reading in Isaiah chapter 26. I got a quick one. Con, Elder. Revelation 1 and 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds oh. and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all the kindreds of the earth shall well even so because of him among that's right, that's right. Going into, again, the clouds are going to come, the chariots are going to come, the elect are going to be delivered in the chariot, and those chariots are also going to be dread upon Esau Edom, who was also who pierced them. All right, when you read that verse in Revelation, the first chapter, verse 7, it says, they which pierced them. Right. Now, when you read about the account in Matthew, it was only one Roman soldier that pierced them. So it's a reason why they said they, because again, like he said, it's a system. All right, a system of Esau, Edom, the, the modern day beast, the Roman Empire. All right, Yahweh Shai is going to come back, all right, with the angels as he delivers the elect and going to slay the serpent. All right, just as we're going to read here in Isaiah 26. Right. You got it, Zaquan. It's, uh, Isaiah chapter 26 and 20. It says, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself as it were a little, uh, as it. As it were for a little moment. And again, the chambers like the, the chamber is allegory for the chariots. The chariots. Okay. All right. And in the chariots, that's where we're going to be changed. Right. Okay. That's where we're going to, the marriage is going to take place, the ceremony, and we're going to be changed. We ain't going to have these bodies. Mm -hmm. We're going to have new bodies. All right. This is all salvation right here, what we're reading. Mm -hmm. Salvation, not only just, it means us going in the chariots, but also us being changed from this flesh that we're in. And that's only going to be able to happen when Yahweh Shai comes and brings those chariots of salvation, those horsemen, all right? Those horses and chariots, the cavalry, okay? 
can I get some, bro? You got it, right? That word um, chamber in the Hebrew is uh, Strong's H2315, Hadar. And uh, it says a uh, bed chamber, a room, the innermost or in, in, innermost part. So, like, it kind of reminds me of uh, the Holy of Holies. Like, mm -hmm. you know, when you're in there with, you know, with the Ark of the Covenant, you know, in the tabernacle, like, you in the presence of the Al Shah, the right. Al you know what I'm saying? Like, that's like the most intimate. Uh, closest we can get, right. you know what I'm saying, to the Lord. That's mm -hmm. where covenants take place right. in the secret chamber yeah. the, between, a, you know, a man and a woman. You know, they, you go to, you know, they have the feast and then eventually y'all go, in, they go into that tent, that secret chamber, <clears throat> or a king's bed will be called the chamber and that's where the covenant will be made. So when we go up into those chariots, that's going to be the fulfillment right. of the new covenant. Mm -hmm. It's going to be made in the secret place. It's that's not right. for, you know, Everybody, everybody ain't gonna be there. Mm -hmm. That's right, man, and it's beautiful. And um, when you read it in Second uh, Ezra, the thirteenth chapter, and that is a very vivid uh, precept or a very vivid chapter, I'd rather say, that goes into Yahweh Shai coming down with those chariots. I don't want my Yahweh Shai coming down with those chariots. All right, because you read about that, especially toward the end of that chapter, when Ezra is receiving that vision. You know, he's also seeing the northern kingdom, and he's asking, "Yo, who are these?" You know, and Ezra, I'm sorry, the angel has to tell Ezra, look, these are your brothers that were scattered a long time ago in the days of King Solomon Nassar. But the beautiful part about that is that is the union of all the tribes coming together and receiving the covenant. Because the last time that happened was when we was in the wilderness with Moses. When we received the law, all right, and the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom received the covenant together. You know, so it's going into just like the first covenant, the tribes were together to receive it. The second covenant. The elect of the tribes are going to be together receiving it. Hopefully that made sense. You know, because when you read about that account, when, when um, I'm sorry, when the covenant was given in the Old Testament, things happened. You know, it was fire. You know, when you read it in Ezra, it talks about four gates. You know, fire, cold, you know, coldness. It was a, things that happened. You know what I'm saying? Literally matter reacted. Existence elements reacted. You know, when you read 2 Ezra 13, you got the nukes that's going to come, the dread that's going to happen, you know, the... The, the, the fire and the, and the laser beams and such goes into all of that, you know, and then the tribes are going to be brought back together in the air where they're going to receive the new covenant in the chariot, you know. But, yeah, you got it, though, Saquon. So Isaiah 26 and 20. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers mm. and shut the doors uh, and shut thy doors about thee. It was the same wording very similarly to the, um, to the ark uh, as well. Noah's ark, mm -hmm. when the spirit of the Lord shut the doors, yep. you know, it was the same concept. You know, just as that ark was equated with salvation, you know, from the water, these chariots are equated with salvation from the fire. You know, you got it. Hide thyself as it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. There you go. That indignation is going into the judgment the Lord is going to bring via the nuclear missiles and also the chariots of salvation. As we read earlier in Habakkuk, the third chapter, that's all equated with the indignation of the Lord. He's going to use Esau to bring indignation by how he allowed him to create weaponry and missiles, nukes at that. And he's going to also use that indignation with his chariots bringing forth fire too. So it's going to be on both sides, on all sides, for real, for real. And that's the spirit that camped last night. We were talking about Enoch. We talked about how Enoch mm. was uh, being the, you know what I'm saying? It, uh, it, 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 the, the earth was so bad at that time that the Lord scooped him up out of there. Yeah. You see, because uh, just like we just read, he said, uh, hide thyself as for a little moment. Until the righteous judgment be overpassed. Mm -hmm. You see? So while the Lord is judging this place, he's going to deliver his elect. That's right. You see? So we don't have to, so we're not going to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. If the Lord willing, we those spirits. You know what I'm saying? Verse 21, it says, For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. Hey, you know what? That's, that's beautiful because it says the Lord cometh out of his place, right? Mm -hmm. We read earlier going into as you know earlier in this chapter it went into how we sung the new song first and then the Lord started bringing that jet that dread right or can you read that part again really quick about him coming out of his place it's uh, Isaiah 26 and 21 for behold the Lord coming out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. I'm gonna read this real quick this is Hosea chapter 5 verse 15 I will go and return unto my place until they acknowledge their offense so he returned unto his place and where we acknowledged our offense and sung the new song and we were revived as earlier in Isaiah 26 says, then the Lord came, word. a man of his word, he came out of his place. You know, so Hosea 5 and 15 says, I will go and return unto my place 
till they have acknowledged their offense, which is what we're doing as we preach the gospel, and seek my face in their affliction, they will see me early. So he's going to return to his place. Read that again, Baba Kishore. Uh, says, for behold, the Lord cometh out of his place. So he's going to come out of his place. Right. Mm -hmm. To punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. So our, our lamentation and our crying unto the Lord and acknowledging our offense is equated with the Lord coming out of his place and destroying those workers of iniquity, the wicked pretty much, including the wicked of our people. Okay? Us doing what we're doing is work. Is part of the Lord coming out of his place and visiting. That's why all these events are happening in the earth right now. That's why it's signs in the heavens. That's why you had an eclipse on April the 8th. And all these strange events and occurrences that are happening on the earth is because we acknowledge our offense through the Holy Spirit. On top of other spiritual things, but it's still lined up with all of that. That's why this stuff's happening right now. Yep. All right. And as the scriptures say, salvation is next by the chariots. Yep. Okay. That's next. You got it, Saquon. It says, and, uh, the earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. There you go. It's going to be a lot of death, a lot second of judgment. Death. The second, second death. death. That's right. Which is the first death was by water. Okay. And this one's going to be by fire. Okay. Right. And you can read into chapter 27 too. All right. I got a precept. Okay. Uh, concerning that uh, chamber. This is uh, Joel 2 and 16. Mm -hmm. This is symbolic of us preparing ourselves for the Lord. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Mm -hmm. They get ready to meet. Now I'm going to go to this uh, breakdown by uh, Gil. It says, this refers to a custom among the Jews at the time of espousals when the bridegroom and the bride were introduced into the nuptial chamber mm. where the marriage was complete. According to the Jews, the marriage was not finished before the blessing of the bridegroom and the bride was not complete, but the marriage was complete when they entered into the chamber. Heavy. Then they were married. That proves right there the second covenant is going to happen in the chamber. In the chariot. In the chamber. Right? In the chariot. That's right. You don't got the second covenant right now. That's The Lord has that set aside as a special union for after salvation comes. You know, we've been given the down payment. That's what we've been given, the down payment and the earnest of the spirit, which Jake don't understand that. We're under grace right now, okay? Once we get into the chambers, grace is going to be over. You know, the law is going to be in our inward parts because, what, we're not going to be able to sin. The reason why we're under grace right now because we're, we've sinned, you know what I'm saying, we threw. We can't keep the law right now. That makes me think about the Lord's prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Right, right. We got to be being up to be and be changed and all mm -hmm. that. So we actually going to be changed up there. That's right. The marriage is going to be complete up there. Mm -hmm. Then we come back down. That's right. That's you right. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's heavy, man. That's heavy. Because the order in the heavens is already established. So we're going to have to be up in the heavens to be established before we come back down. That's right. You know? That's right. It's beautiful. While we're up there being changed. The Lord is dropping dropping laser beams and everything on the yeah. earth, incinerating motherfuckers. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Hey, you know, um, <laughs> rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell therein, and woe unto the inhabitants of the earth. Yep. You know, so right when salvation happens, destruction is happening to the wicked. Right. You know, it's hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Right. And before the destruction comes, the bride is preparing herself. That's right. Bathing mm -hmm. in the oils, mm -hmm. making herself ready. Then she gets to the secret chamber. She right. doesn't, you don't just walk in the nope. secret chamber smelling like. Victoria's Secret, you know, Bath and Body Works. Yeah, you just in there. Yeah, here I am. Yeah, no. You don't just walk. No, there's a process that it, the the bride has to go through before she's entered into that covenant, and that's where we are now as the True. elect. You know, trying, you know, to the best of our ability, bathing in the oils, mm -hmm. which is this truth, preparing ourselves for the coming of our Lord. That's right, because you got Israelites that are out here that I know that know that they're Israelites that want to skip that process. Mm -hmm. You know, at one breath, you had people that said there wasn't going to be no Jacob's trouble, and now there is Jacob's trouble. And, you know, you got the Israelites with a lackluster mindset of just do as thou wilt, pretty much, and expect salvation. Thinking they're going to get on charity. After yeah. A whole bath. Exactly. After a whole bath. Right. A yeah. cowboy shower. <laughs> Out there at camp, strapped up, bulletproof vests and everything. You know, you bearing false witness on Jake, saying it's that and third, and just expect the Lord to just say, you good, come on through. No. Yeah, you got to pay for that. Lord. Yeah, don't worship the Lord. Uh, yeah, worship the house, exactly. Paul ain't, uh, Paul's writings ain't accurate. Take it from, right. add it to the scriptures. Mm -hmm. then you gonna get on, but you're going to get delivered. Yeah, bro. Nah, the scriptures say you, don't even, you ain't even supposed to ask amiss. 
These dudes are worshiping a miss and Man. expect to be delivered. You know? You got it, Saquon. All right, this is the deliverance of Israel, Isaiah 27 and 1. It says, In that day, the Lord with his sword and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent. Now, I wanted to bring that up because earlier, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 was brought out. Going into how, behold, he cometh with clouds, and he shall also get even they that pierced him. You know, so the clouds portion was the end of chapter 26. And the getting them that pierced him is the beginning part of chapter 27. Because we remember, you know, back then there obviously wasn't chapters divided back then when Isaiah had these scrolls written right here. You know, it was all one part of, you know, a long story, a long writing that was there. You know, that's why I like to read the end of chapter 6 going into the beginning of chapter 27. You know, because it still goes hand in hand with what's happening at the end of chapter 26. All right. So after we were taken up into the chamber, all right, as the indignation of the Lord is taking place, who was the indignation of the Lord directed to? You got it. Um, yep. Isaiah 27 and 1. In that day, the Lord with his sword and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent. There you go. Just as it said, his bow is made quite naked. Right here is likened to his sword, which is just going into how the Lord is going to bring judgment upon the heathen, upon the wicked, starting with Esau, Edom. All right, NATO, the EU, the elites, okay, that, that, that hegemon seat that's right there. All right, and just granted, just everybody else that's on the planet Earth, if you ain't in that bunker or if you ain't in that chamber, your ass is going to be incinerated if you're in Babylon. All right, and other parts of the Earth, you know, and the Lord, just because Babylon is going to be burned up and other parts of the Earth don't mean that other parts of the Earth ain't going to be touched. Just because other parts ain't going to be burned don't mean it ain't going to be jacked up. We read earlier the Earth is going to reel to and fro. Water's going to be out of its place, you know, so it's going to be jacked up in a lot of different places, you know, just Babylon is going to be burned with fire, okay? You got it, bro. Even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. There you go, Leviathan, that crooked serpent. That's going into Esau, and in pretty much going into Esau. That's talking about him. You can read about that same serpent in Revelation, the 12th chapter, all right, where you read about going into that woman with the stars, and the sun and the moon that's likened to Israel. And then you got that dragon that's likened unto the Roman Empire, which is Esau at the end of the day. Right. So this verse right here is going into Yahweh Shai and the angels coming back to defeat the Roman Empire, just as the scriptures say, the fourth beast. Okay? Right. That's why it says the piercing serpent, Leviathan, the piercing serpent. All right, Daniel talks about a beast having seven heads and ten horns. The same thing in Revelation, the 12th chapter, and Revelation, the 13th chapter. All right, so he's going to come and get, and get that beast. And, of course, Esau has groups and such set up. You know, yeah, you have um, NATO, the EU. You obviously have the Illuminati, which are all those families. Okay, but Yahabashiah is going to come and take out Esau, Edom. Okay, just as you read it in Genesis 3, which um, that's pretty much it on that verse unless you see something else right there. Nah, we do it. Okay, well, we can read Genesis, the third chapter. You got a precept? Huh. Okay, we can hold Genesis chapter. You can bring yours out. Let's hold that going into how he's going to bruise the head. And we can also close it out unless anybody has anything else in Psalm 68, going into the hoary head. But starting a few verses prior to that, because it talks about the chariots of salvation before that. Okay, you got it, Amafia. Right, this is uh, Psalms 119 and 126. And can you read just a little louder just because of the phones right here? Right, it's Psalms 119 and 126. It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. Mm. This is uh, Lord, the Lord's going to uh, produce his work that everybody's going to see. He's going to show you how to shot you, all right? Because, mm -hmm. uh, like I say, now he's let the uh, sins reach up to heaven, all right? Now they, uh, Esau, he's not uh, going on and producing the law, statute, commandments. So they got to be established back on the earth, all right? Mm -hmm. If I can get one more, I'm shocked because you're talking about, like, we have to be delivered, so we have to be under that covering to be delivered up, you know, as we went into, uh, we was in uh, um, Isaiah 26, mm -hmm. yeah, going to those chariots, all right, so it's got a, a certain way we have to walk about things to receive that mercy from the Lord, right back. all right, because that's the work, Lord doing the work, what's that going to come forth with, the thermonuclear destruction, all right, the uh, actual uh, chariots, like I said, the beings coming from, from the chariots, a lot of death is going to come upon the earth, uh, this is, 2 Peter 3 and 14, they say, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace mm. without spot and blameless. 
Alright, and then when you read up in the chapter of Second uh, Peter 3, what is that going into? The day of the Lord. Alright, that destruction the Lord is going to bring forth. So you want to make, uh, like I say, we want to be at peace. So we want to be diligent, you know, constantly uh, in the word. Alright, walking the path of the Lord as he guides us, as it says in, uh, what is that, uh, uh, Proverbs uh, 3, around the 5th and 6th verse. Alright, he's going to guide our path. You know, so we want to be spotless, blameless. When that, when that time comes, because we want to receive that salvation. We want to be washed clean. That's right. Where was we at? Um, I know I, Genesis chapter 3, um, smiting the, uh, the head. You know what I'm Did you want to get that Genesis 3, Sir Arthur? Yep. Okay. And we can end it off when I say uh, Psalm 68, unless somebody got a precept after that. All right. Um, let's we'll start at Genesis 3 and 14. It says, and the Lord, Yahweh, Now the reason, now the reason why we're going into this here, is because this is an ancient judgment that was given unto the serpent <coughs> way back before. Right. So it was already pre-written about the serpent's destruction, which even Yahweh said, "Behold, I seen Satan fall down as lightning from heaven." Right. All right. So we all have seen that through the through the spirit. Right. Okay. And this is already again a pre-prophecy going into what we're waiting for in the very end. Right. All right. So the end, the, the end was already declared in the beginning. As the scriptures say, okay? That's why the scriptures say, cursed shall thou be above all cattle, because mm -hmm. no other kingdom is going to go down like his kingdom. Yep. Mm. You yep. know what I'm saying? He got the worst judgment of all of the nations. It's a field of Esau. That's Sorry. right. God. This is Genesis 3 and 14. And the Lord, Yahweh Shai, said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. And there you go, just as he explained it. All right, they're going to be, they're going to have a worse outcome than any other nation. Okay, go ahead. And above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all yeah. the days of thy life. And the so-called Christian will say, this is when the serpent used to have legs before this. Yeah. <laughs> and now it don't got legs no more. But where in the hell did it ever say that it had legs even earlier in here? It don't describe anything about having feet or nothing like that. It just says, it shall be upon thy belly and eat of the dust. People just adding to the scriptures. Of course, we know that, but it's like, bro, they adding <laughs> extra, extra, extra nominally, if that's a word. Yeah, it just symbolizes he's going to be on a low, the right. lowest of the heathen. That's like, it. A, a low state. Yeah. You know, basically, uh, when you were associated with a viper or a snake, you're a low person. He's going to be the lowest of the low. That's right. All right. And dust shall thou eat all our life. He's basically... He's going to be the low. He's going to be through. Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> hey, just as Isaiah the 14 chapter says, worms shall crawl under thee and worms shall crawl over thee. Right. You know, it's just going down and him being brought down to hell. Right. Just as the scriptures say, which hell is the grave or condition? Okay. That's what that's going into. You got it, bro. Yep. Yeah. It says, um, I was looking at that word dust, but I'll continue reading. It says, upon thy belly shalt thou go and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. All right. The woman is going into Israel symbolically, starting with Yahweh Shai. Starting with Yahweh Shai. All right. You got it. It says America, Babylon, sit in the dust. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I was thinking about that scripture, too. Mm -hmm. Sit in the dust, oh virgin daughter, yeah. tender and delicate and is, stuff. Is that Revelation uh, 12 or Revelation 13 where it talks about the woman? Revelation 12. Uh, Revelation 12. Yeah, yep. Mm -hmm. oh, just made me think of that. If yeah. Between me and the woman. Mm -hmm. I did a lesson on that you know, okay. uh, about a year and a half ago. God. Yeah, that woman right there. Again, you know, that woman symbolically represents Israel yeah. in Revelation 12. And just as it symbolically represents Israel, like you said, goes into the seed of the woman right here. God. It says, and between thy seed and her seed, and it, it shall bruise thy head. And thou shalt bruise his heel. All right, so it's saying, it shall bruise thy head. All right, and we're waiting for that to happen. That's going to happen when Yahweh Shai comes down and destroys the serpent. Just as we read earlier in what Isaiah 27, how he's going to punish Leviathan, that crooked serpent. Okay, that's what that's talking about. That's going to be led by Yahweh Shai, the angels in those chariots and such. As we're delivered. Okay, Lord will aware of that number, but as the elect is delivered. And then it says, thou shalt bruise its heel. And our heel was bruised, but you can heal from that. And it was bruised because we was through as a nation of people. We've been sacked, pillaged ample times throughout history, separated from the Lord, uh, you know, put in captivity. The list goes on and on, especially when it comes to Esau's influence. You know, Esau's captivity has been the most evil, heinous, worst captivity of all time. So without a doubt, our heel was 
Our heel was bruised. That Achilles heel was snipped, but it grew back. Now that bruising of the head, you can't do nothing about that. It's incurable, just as the scriptures say. Yep. Okay, you got it. Come on, continue on. In uh, verse 16, it says, well, was that the point you wanted? The heel thing? Yeah, that was, that was pretty much the point. You know, and I'm also going to bring this precept out here in um, Nahum, actually. In Nahum, the third chapter, and it's going right into it. It's a direct precept to it. All right. This is the book of Nahum, chapter three, verse 17. It says, um, thy crown are as the locusts and thy captains as the great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges in the cold day. Now, the cold day symbolically represents when things are cool, chill. You can read about that cool of day also in Genesis before the judgment came to Adam, Eve, and the serpent. All right, so they're able to do what they got to do in the cool of day before the judgment comes. Just as what uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 11 says, though sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore it is fully set in the hearts of the sons of men to do evil. All right, reason why they're doing that is because they're able to chill. It's the cool of day. Ain't no heat. Ain't no judgment. Mm. But now we're coming into that time of the judgment, yeah. that transferring. Okay? So it says, back in Nahum, the third chapter, it says, Thy crown are the locusts, and thy captains as the great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges in the cold day. But when the sun ariseth, they flee away, and their place is not known where they are. All right, so when that sun arises, that's going into judgment coming. Even Yahweh Shai is likened unto the son of righteousness when you read that in Malachi, the fourth chapter. Mm -hmm. So when Yahweh Shai comes with those angels, just as Enoch prophesied, how he's going to come with thousands of his saints. It's going to be the end for the ruling class over here today, Esau, Edom. Right. It's going to be the end when he comes with those chariots. That's right. Verse 18. Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria, which symbolically is talking about E. Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. Mm. Thy people are scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. The scriptures does talk about they're going to go into the bunkers. They're going to go into hell. You know, though they climb into heaven. Okay says all those things verse 19 there is no healing of thy bruise right. just as the head of the serpent is crushed there is no healing of thy bruise and thy wound is grievous Man. all that hear the brood of thee shall clap the hands over thee yep. for upon Salakia, for upon whom hath thy not thy wickedness pass continually so pretty much it's saying like look he got to go because if he's to keep going his wickedness is going to be everywhere this man has done all this wickedness so he got to get out of the picture you know, and so that scripture is a precept to what was just read in Genesis chapter three. You know, and any, if anybody don't got nothing, we can end. You, you got something? Go cool. Psalm sixty-eight, starting around like verse seventeen. Okay, cool, cool. That's a bet. Yeah, start around verse fifteen. Actually, the point is in verse twenty-one. All right, Psalm chapter sixty-eight, verse fifteen. It says, "The hill of Yahweh Shai is as the hill of Bashan, and high hill." As the hill of Bashan. And this is going into Israel, all right, in the glorified form under Yahweh Shai. All right, you got it. Verse 16. Why leap ye, ye high hills? This is going into the other nations. Okay, go ahead. Mm, it's like, like, why, why the heathen rage? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It says, um. Because, you know, you got people that try to say that the next kingdom is going to be either Russia or China and everything like that. Yeah. You know, and they're definitely not expecting little old us. To be gross. to be the next rulers yeah. on the earth. Yeah, gross, disgusting, exactly. I mean, yeah, switch, switch yeah. there ain't gonna be no more frogs, <laughs> no more flies, no more yeah. Yeah, yeah. no more mice. <laughs> yeah, whack karate, no more of that. Yeah, everybody gonna have to learn that. Anime every goddamn Yeah, man. Crazy. Yeah, bro. It ain't gonna be no balance with it. You know? But just going into that, you know, that's why it says, why leap ye, ye high hills, bro? Because nobody expects us to be the next kingdom. You know, when you look at it, the so-called Negro, Latino, Native American, we don't even got a seat in the UN. So, you know? Israel don't even think that. Hell no. No, two-thirds of Israel think Russia going to be the next yeah. one. See? And they just going along with the get-along. Is everybody God else saying that? Go come up out yeah. the Yeah. Nah, exactly. Stupid. <laughs> you got it, out. Yep. It says, um, verse 17, Excuse me, the middle of verse 16, it says, This is the hill which the Most High desireth to dwell in. Yea, the Lord shall dwell in it forever. There you go, because people try to say God is for everybody. Well, that verse clearly says he ain't for everybody. That verse clearly says he's for one people. And he likens us to a hill, just as we're also likened to a mount in certain scriptures. Mount Zion, as you will. 
Bring it out. You got it out. Kind of says the chariots of the most high are twenty thousand. Even thousands of angels, the Lord, Yahweh, is among them. There you go. Now it's going right back to the chariots of salvation again. And he's numbering them just as the horsemen are numbered in certain scriptures back in wartime. Right. You know, you got X amount of foot soldiers, 20,000 chariots. He's doing a very similar fashion, only going into the heavenly perspective of it. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't literally mean that there is 20,000 angels that are there in the chariots. It's just a lot of, it's a lot of them. Yeah. You know? How long is it going to take you to count, 20, count the 20,000? Exactly. Exactly. You ain't going to have time to count. You're going to be getting wet those out. Yeah. yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And when you're being delivered, you ain't going to be counting them in the yeah. air. <laughs> nah, bro. You focus on getting beamed up. Yeah. You know? You got it, bro. Yep. Continue on. In um, verse 6, I'm sorry, verse, uh, verse 18, it says, Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord, uh, Yahweh Shem El Shad, might dwell among them. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. We delivered. Mm -hmm. We being delivered, bro. Yeah. The Lord has taken his elect. Mm -hmm. He's taken his gift back. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You got it. And, and where it says, Thou hast led captivity captive, that those who had us in captivity, they're going to go in captivity. That's right. That's right, bro. Revelation 13. Exactly, bro. Um, it says, uh, verse verse 19, Blessed be Yahweh Shemel Shai, who daily loaded us with benefits. That's right, bro. And this is a crucial benefit, knowing who we are, knowing what, knowing who the Lord is, knowing who Yahweh Shai is, and knowing who he came for, which is us. Lord, when we have the elect, but we for sure know we Israelites. So it's beautiful. When you read about the gospel, like Christianity brings a negative and bad rap to the gospel. Because they'll just say good news, but they won't tell you what's good about it. Well, no, it's good that... We got deliverance after, we, after we've been in captivity so long. Right. We got a kingdom coming to us. Every nation has had a time to rule except little old Israel who had 40 years, right. you know, of peace. Technically 80 under David, but still it was warfare and stuff going on with that. We didn't have nothing but a true 40 years of peace under a proper rulership, bro. You know, so this is what we've waited for. That's why earlier it was read in Acts, the first chapter. What they asked you, how was Shai after he pretty much told them what was going to happen? Is it now going to be the time where you restore the kingdom of Israel? Mm. You know, so this is the fulfillment of that right there. You know, and this again, that don't apply to everybody. That is the fulfillment of the restoration of the kingdom of Israel, which again, I quoted it earlier, Revelation 12 and 10. Now has come salvation. All right. We had to wait. It wasn't time for it back then when Yahweh Shai ascended up. Now it's time for salvation. You got it, bro. It says, um, all right, read verse 20, Psalm 68 20. It says, uh, He that is our power is the power of salvation. And unto Yahweh, Bashim Yahweh Shai, the Lord belongeth the issues from death. The Lord is saying, He's going to bring the judgment. He's going to bring the death. All any issue pertaining to it, He's in full control of it. All right, but it made mention of His chariots of salvation as we're reading about. All right, and what are those chariots of salvation going to do? They're going to save. The elect and are going to bring dread and punishment and judgment unto the wicked, which that charge is going to be led by Yahweh Shai, who the world ignorantly calls Jesus Christ. Okay, you got it. I don't want you to verse twenty-one. But the Most High shall wound the head of his enemy. There you go. He shall wound the head of his enemies. So he's going to do that with what? The chariots of salvation. Woo! He's going to wound the head of his enemies. Okay, you got it. Yep. It says, and the hairy scalp. Of such and one that goeth on still in his trespasses. Yeah, when you go into the, that word hairy in the Hebrew, you'll find the word sha'ir, which goes into hairy, which also you'll find the word goat there as well, or seer. Mm -hmm. All right, like Mount Seir would be Mount Sha'ir in the ancient Hebrew, which Esau Edom is equated with seer. So this verse right here, if you can receive the mystery for those that are listening, that's talking about Edom right there. Yeah. He's going to come to destroy Edom, who is that crooked serpent. You know, the modern day Roman Empire was led by the Edom. I'm sorry, the ancient empire and the modern day Roman Empire is led by the Edomites. Yep. All right. They that pierced him were Edomites. That was a nation full of Edomites, the Roman Empire. All right. Led by Esau Edom. All right. This is the judgment going into the fall of Babylon, the fall of Esau's rulership, where eventually Esau is going to serve captivity and then be burned up. All right. But the start of that salvation and the start of that destruction is going to be led by Yahweh Shai bringing forth the chariots. Yeah. Okay, so when we see those chariots, obviously we have it in mind. Look, we're being watched. 
We have it in mind and we see it. This is the glory of the Lord. But we also need to have it in mind that these are signs that the Lord is going to come and gather his elect. Because what we see up there moving around sometimes for those that see him, for those that don't. All right. That's what the Lord is going to use to deliver his elect. All right. Those chariots of salvation. You know. Is there, we see any more on that one, bro? Because that was pretty much the point in that verse 21. Yeah, uh, there's, um, there's uh, two more. Okay, come on. Two more verses. Uh, the Lord said, I will bring again from Bashan. I will bring my people again from the depths of the sea. You know, it kind of reminds me of um, uh, uh, Revelation 17, you know, the sea of mm -hmm. people. You know, a sea representing people, I can say. Right. Israel being gathered from that multitude, you know, mm -hmm. scattered throughout the earth. Verse 23 says... That thy, that thy foot may be dipped in the blood of thy enemies and the tongue of thy dogs in the same. Yeah, that's right. Because <laughs> I remember we, we read that, but in the past, I'm saying, we read mm -hmm. it in the past, but that's been a mess because I've seen that. Yeah, for know, sure. Foot be dipped in the blood of your enemies. Like, yeah, bro. That's war terminology, bro. Yep. Like, again, like, you know, if you don't understand war terminology, then the Bible is going to offend you like crazy. You're going to be thinking there are going to be horses and, you know, Pegasus flying in the air and, Weird. you know what I'm saying? And, and actual locusts flying, you know, with stingers that are killing the third part of, you know what I'm saying? You would think all those things. But when you have war terminology, you can understand it a lot more because what? Exodus 15. Yahweh is a man of war. Yahweh is his name. All right. So, you know, to fully understand that, you got to know how the Lord moves, bro. You got to know he's a man of war. In order to understand the Bible and not get offended, you got to know he's a man of war, you know? So any closing points? One more. Gone. Oh, yeah, that's right. You said you had that. Precept. Habakkuk chapter 3 and 12. Thou did, you did march through the land in indignation. All right. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. March, mm -hmm. symbolic of an army. That's right. That's right. <laughs> the chariots ain't going to literally be marching. <laughs> Come on, bro. <laughs> but it's just you're symbolic that's of right. war. You know what I'm saying? The chariots. That's right. And that word chariot, marakab, or, mm -hmm. or, or uh, rakab, <coughs> it means a, a vehicle. That's right. A riding. Who's riding those chariots? That's the right. angels, man. That's it. That's it, bro. People try to pose the question, why do the angels need to ride in anything? You take it up with the Lord, bro. We just saying what the scriptures say. Why do you need to ride? Yeah, exactly. I'm telling you. I'm yeah, saying, right? I said, was, was you got a car, but the angels got to walk. Bro. <laughs> yeah, factuals, man. Yeah, it says, Habakkuk 3 and 13, Thou went it forth, you, that you went forth for the salvation of your people, even the salvation of thine anointed. Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked. Mm. All right. You strip their bones from head to toe. Y'all wound us their head out of the house of the wicked. I'm glad you read that version, right? That's NLT? Well, I, I finished. I, I, went, I went back and forth. The end of it was NLT, but the rest of it was. Gun. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Wounding the head. Out of the house of the wicked. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You know, so when those chariots are a reminder of many things when you look at it through the spirit, you know, but hey, that's a sign that Esau is going down, bro. You know, they equated with salvation, but also in the midst of salvation, somebody has to be punished. You know, matter of fact, you know, we can end it here. I'm, you know, we can end it here. Proverbs, I believe, 21 and 18. I can get it for you. Come. Uh, ransom. Wicked. Yep. Cool. Proverbs 21 and 18. The wicked shall be a ransom for the righteous and the transgressor for the upright. That's right. Ransom for the righteous. So it's got to be a lot of death. When we're being saved, Lord, when we are that number, there's got to be a lot of death. And that death acts as a ransom. You know, as you also read it in what, um, what is that? Um, we don't got to get it, but Isaiah 40, the 40th chapter, it talks about how the Lord required men's lives for our lives. And he uses the example of the Ethiopians and the Egyptians when he slew Pharaoh and those chariots in the Red Sea. You know, so that's how the Lord just operates, man. Right. You know, so in the midst of that salvation, he's going to require men's lives. Just as the scriptures say in 2 Ezra 9 and 22. Let the multitude then perish who was born in vain, but let my great be kept. For with great labor have I made it perfect. Okay? So hopefully that was edifying. Any closing points? Anything? Cool. We can end it off on that. We want to give all praise, all honor, and all glory to Yahweh, Bahashim, Yahweh Shai, Bahashim, Rechakodash. We also want to give double honors to our apostles and the elders of Great Millstone. We want to say peace, blessings, and salutations as always unto your elect that are across the four winds of this earth. Fulfilling your lots in all truth and all sincerity. Shalom. Shalom. Shalom.